CMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help. Hello, my name is David Morgan. Um, I am the Environmental Planner and Conservation Agent. The August 20th, sorry, not the 21st, but the very first, August 1st, 2024, public meeting of the Arlington Conservation Commission will be conducted in a remote format consistent with Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, which extended remote participation in public meetings until the 31st of March 2025. This meeting is being recorded, and the recording may be made publicly available. I just put a link in the chat to all of the meeting materials. You can reference those at any point, and I might pop back in the chat if others join late to alert them to the link. Please note that the Zoom chat feature may be used for questions and comments that contribute to the Commission's procedures, and if it's used otherwise, it may be disabled at the Chair's discretion. The public comment period will follow each hearing. The Conservation Commission encourages attendees to ask questions and offer comments during the public comment period. In Chapter 1, our Commission Chair will facilitate tonight's meeting. Each vote taken tonight will be taken via roll call vote, and we start with roll call attendance. So Chuck, to you for attendance and to review our agenda for you. Sure. I'm going to start out with the agenda. So we're going to do um, administrative first, and we don't have minutes tonight. So we'll talk with uh, administrator's report, and our discussion items are 66 and 66 R Dudley and 993 Mass Ave for an enforcement order. Update from the Water Bodies Working Group, Tree Committee, CPA, Park and Rec, although I don't think there's a um, discussion about Park and Rec tonight because they didn't have a meeting. We'll go on to a request for determination for 24 Sheridan Park, and then a notice of intent filing for Medford Boat Club, notice of intent for Monotomy Rocks Park, and notice of intent for 103, 103 Thorndike Street. And did I mention that um, the first hearing on our agenda is a notice of intent for uh, Thorndike Place, which will be continued to August 15th. Um, so that's our agenda. And now we'll do a roll call vote. And I'll start out with Mike. Oh, Susan, you have your hand up. Yes, sorry, Chuck. Um, we did have minutes. Um, they were older minutes. I I propose that we do those at the next meeting, just because this meeting is so large, and I don't know if everybody reviewed them. What was the? Uh, they were from were the three twenty one twenty four. Okay. So we still won't be doing any minutes, but we'll have okay. two to do at our next meeting. Thank okay. You. Great. Okay. So on to roll call. Um, so Mike Gildas game. Present. Susan Chapnick. Present. David White. Here. David Kaplan. Here. Brian McBride. Here. And Chuck Taroni is here. Uh, associate members, Sarah El Faro Franco. Um, here. And Eileen Coleman. Here. Okay. So just Nathaniel Stevens is uh, out this meeting and we'll move on to uh, administrative review. And we have correspondence that comes in all the time. And I just want to let everybody attending, everyone know there's attending tonight's meeting that a correspondence received is all available for the public. And for a full list, you can contact our conservation agent and he will be providing a link in the chat at this time. And then uh, David, you have, uh, administrative uh, report? Yeah, I want to call attention to two pieces of correspondence very quickly. One is um, related to the Algonquin gas line that's over by Sunnyside and their, the federal um, interstate gas line so that they are exempt from uh, the local uh, wetlands protection and are covered by the Natural Gas Act, so also the Wetlands Protection Act. Um, they're going to be doing a little bit of anomaly investigation. I'll be working for weeks. So that'll be happening um, 
Let's see. The other thing I wanted to mention was the receipt of a letter relating to the conservation restriction up at Sims, the Arlington 360 and Brightview property. Um, we're party to that conservation restriction. We were notified on the, well, the letters date of the 26th. I got it on the 29th that they intend to sell that property. The Brightview portion of the property is up for sale and transfer. So um, I have open questions with uh, town council about how to proceed vis-a-vis -vis our enforcement of the conservation restriction there and whether this sale can move forward without that being brought into compliance first. My current understanding is that it cannot. So um, we just should keep abreast of developments here. The last thing I'll touch on is just for town day, um, I filed our request for a table at town day. It's a $75 charge and um, said that that should come out of the local uh, bylaw, the account. And so I'm looking for the commission to authorize that expense with a vote. Okay, Bessie, you have your hand up. Do you have a question about something I said? Yeah, and a quick question about Algonquin. I, I reviewed quickly and maybe I missed it, but is there, I know they're exempt, but there's an opportunity to work with them on an appropriate seed mix for the restoration. I think that's um, sort of a naturalized or planted area. And yeah. It'd be nice to, to keep it that way and not have them plant turf grass in there. They won't. As, as they're um, backing out. Okay. Yeah. I, so we worked together last fall, I would say, um, to determine what the scope of work was when it was lowered down, like to the south along Alewife Brook. And mm -hmm. um, we reviewed at a site visit with them. And we, we talked about their restoration measures and mitigation measures and everything. And it's all pretty copacetic. It's what we'd ask for anyway. And since we can't require it, it's good they're voluntarily meeting those standards. And it is a uh, conservation wetland mix that they're using now. Okay. No, thank you, David. I appreciate it. Yeah. Dave, David, do you have a um, documentation of that? Just so we know for the future when another project comes up that we yeah. can kind of ask for the same thing? Okay, great. Yeah, I got their O&M from then the last time and it's i believe it's referenced again in the um the letter that they supplied the notification thank you mm -hmm. that is it for administrator all right on to our second item on the agenda the discussion so we're going to start out with 66 66r dudley street 993 mass ave for an enforcement order and I think at the at the last meeting we had a deadline, and the deadline was for a plan, a set of plans, so the commission could understand what was going on um, and what was being contemplated about what was the work that was going to happen to bring this uh, project and this site back into compliance. David Morgan, could you update the commission on what's happened uh, since our last meeting? Sure, I've been told that both parties, the uh, Condo Association at 993 Mass Ave and the owners of 66 Dudley have been looking for a surveyor and uh, <clears throat> they have procured surveyors to assess the property. Um, I advise the owners of 66 Dudley that it would be best to have a plan to present um, even though the survey hasn't been completed as yet, knowing that you know, the survey is really only going to tell us the borders uh, of the properties. And this work, of course, extends across two properties. So uh, restoration plan needn't wait for a survey. I haven't received a restoration plan from other party. Uh, do you have a recommendation for the commission? Uh, 
with the fact that you've talked to both parties and understand where they're at, where they're at and where they're heading. I want to hear from the folks tonight, but I was clear with both parties that I intended to ask the commission to consider fines starting tonight. I am on the fence about that, to be honest, after talking with the chairs. I went back I, to I'm our- here. I'm sorry, Dave, not to interrupt you. I am here. Oh, good. I am. Yes, I am. Yep, I am here. So the- um. The chairs and I talked, we discussed the timeline. My initial recommendation for <laughs> fines was based on our having been engaged with the owners of 66 Dudley since October of last year. And it just seems like you know, time is of the essence at this point. But we did not give them the updated enforcement order until April of this year. And that outlines all of the work to be done for the restoration site. And the same thing applies for the condo association. Both enforcement orders went out at the same time in late April. And so we are roughly three months from the issuance of the original orders, which is a different timeline than I had in mind when I made my recommendation. So, you know, it's of course, always within the commission's purview to consider fines. I leave it to your discretion, but that's the full backstory of where we're at. Okay. Um, so it sounds like, you know, I, so we certainly don't have anything to talk about as far as this. Um, uh, we don't have a plan to review. We don't have, uh, you know. Well, the only, uh, the only thing hold I on, Hold on, hold on. Um, we'll call on you when uh, when we're ready. Okay. Um, so I just want to make sure that we don't start talking about the particulars here. It seems like what's in front of us is an explanation on why we haven't got a plan. We're going to need that from both parties, and um, and then the, for the conservation commission to decide whether or not that you know where to go from here. So with that, um, is. Yeah. It's, do, would you like to talk now? Uh, and would you just introduce yourself uh, for the record? Yeah. Hi, everyone. It's Evelyn LaRusso. Um, I'm one of the owners of 66 Dudley Street. Um, I do have, I told David Morgan that I did secure a surveyor. And I've been in contact with them weekly to try to get a date of when they can come out and survey the land and see what's ours and see what the um, condo association behind us, what is theirs. And um, I gave them everything, the information of what they need, what we need uh, for being surveyed. And um, so basically I'm just waiting for them and I'm, I'm waiting to get plans from them. And then from that, I thought we could begin our restoration from there. I didn't think it was, uh, I did, just didn't think it was enough right now to have a, a sketch, throw a sketch together when We'd have to do it over once the surveyor gives me their plans, their what their their lines are and the borders are and so forth. So, yeah. and, and I've been in touch with um, one of the, I, I think she's one of the trustees for the condo, Thea. Um, so we're, we're just in contact and I'm just waiting for Rover Surveyor to come on out and take care of that for us. Do you have a contract with Rover Surveyor? Yes, I do. I've okay, already so paid, I've already paid them. Okay. So I, I'm important. waiting for them. It's a waiting game now with them. I, I once you have the survey, <laughs> how do you propose to um, implement the planting part of the survey? So once you understand what the information that the survey will give you, okay. there's going to be a second piece, which is replanting, right. revegetation, and restoring. Mm -hmm. Do you have someone you want to work with? With that part or is that no i think we can handle it as our company i think we can handle that okay mm -hmm. okay thank you uh is anyone here from 993 uh, mass ave jennifer i see that you have okay. your hand up would you like to uh update the commission on where you're at with uh the the request on the enforcement order 
Right. So Thea is our property manager. I, I am one of the trustees. So she shared a correspondence between herself and Evelyn. And that was the latest update that we had. We were waiting for the surveyor to, to come on site and complete those assessments. Um, and we're really just waiting on that before we take any other next steps. Is uh, your, is that your surveyor or is that uh, uh, Evelyn's survey? Evelyn's. Okay. Yeah, that would be Evelyn's. So once that survey happens, would you uh, I, do you have plans to uh, meet and uh, discuss this the survey and find out? I mean, since it's on two different properties, have, has that part been figured out? Who is going to do the restoration? Who's responsible for this, or is it going to split down the property line? My understanding is once we get the results from the surveyor, that will help us understand who's responsible for the restoration efforts. Okay. Is that your understanding, Evelyn? Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay. So it sounds like you need some time to, to meet. Do you have an expectation of when the survey is going to be completed? Well, I'm with Michelle, uh, who works for Rover. And I, like I said, I've been contacting her each week, beginning of each week to see uh, when they can schedule schedule us in. That's, you know, so I'm just waiting for them. Unfortunately, it's it's just a waiting game with them. Okay, we need that information to move forward. So okay. at this point, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you uh, just to hold tight. And I wanna talk to the commission and I see that David uh, Kaplan has his hand up. Thank you. Um, and, and thank you both. Uh... Jennifer and Evelyn for the updates. Um, I have a question for, uh, I guess, Ms. LaRusso. Um, I just want to make sure that um, the scope of the survey includes um, characterizing, locating, and quantifying the, the encroachments. Um, I think that'll give a good starting point you know, from which to work off of. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. OK. All right, thanks. Okay. Um, and I believe that was it. Thank you. All right, David. Uh, any other questions? Any discussion amongst the commission? We're looking at um, we're looking at an enforcement order that did say that this uh, you know we really needed to be at a point where we we're looking at a plan tonight. But it looks like, and we ran into this with Arlington three sixty two. It was surveys are tough to find at this point. Um, so. Susan, I see that you have your hand raised. So let's hear uh, from Susan Chapnick. Yeah, probably you were going to say this, Chuck, but I'm thinking since um, both parties are present tonight, they explained that they are working towards um, getting the survey done and a restoration plan that I don't think levying fines at this point is necessary. I think that if we don't see progress, um, on the survey or get a restoration plan in a reasonable time frame, and I would like the commission to set that time frame, then um, then we can consider fines at that point. But it looks like both parties are heading in the right direction. Sure, thank you. Uh, any other commission members who want to make a comment or motion? And this would be, uh, if if you take the motion, you would have to uh, update the existing enforcement order, the new deadline to receive the plan, come back to the commission. And understand that not only we're waiting for a surveyor, but there seems to be a meeting between the two parties that needs to take place also. I'll make a motion. Um to amend the enforcement order to re require um, a restoration plan um, by to, our, excuse me? To extend, extend the deadline, the, right, to, the receive. deadline to, to receive the restoration plan from 725 it was to what is our um, second meeting in September? It would be the 19th. And do, do other commissioners feel that that's a, a sufficient amount of time to get a survey and a plan that gives um, a month and a half? Yeah, I'll, maybe I'll, October. I'll, I'll second that. Okay. I think 
if our meeting is uh, what are our meeting dates david yeah i was just thinking that we should make it the materials deadline prior to that meeting okay meeting so i don't know if you want to open on that could that be the 13th i can find in 30 seconds it would be no wait a minute yeah we might have the wrong one uh, it's the 5th and the 19th, and it would be the 17th. Is that what you have, David? We will have the agenda have that day. Supplemental information would be due on the 11th of September. So given they have to get the survey and then do a plan and have a meeting, is that a reasonable amount of time, or should we make it the next meeting? Yeah, let's make and it. Chuck, well, I'm thinking make it the next meeting. Yeah. I'm going to keep extending because it is hard to get the survey done and then they have to meet about the survey and then they have to do the plan. So the next meeting would be in the next month. So October. What is it? October. Third. I don't meeting dates. Okay. And I guess the supplemental would be on the Thursday before, so the 26th. Okay. It's Wednesdays at noon. Oh, okay. It's so Wednesday. All right. The 25th. So I, I'm in my, um, I revised my motion um, to uh, revise the enforcement order to require restoration plan by September 25th, you said? Is that what yeah. you said? Um, and then um, presence at the meeting um, on October, what was that? Wait a minute. Be, to be, I think the enforcement order had when, the documents would do as well as when um, they needed to present it to the commission at a meeting. Is that not true, David? I don't have the enforcement order in front of me. So, Susan, you're, we're in October, so that would be the meeting we want to see them. So it would be the 24th. Is that what you said? Material by the 24th, and we'll see them on October 3rd. Our schedule says 925. Okay. So materials by September 25th mm. and and present at our October 3rd meeting. Third meeting, yeah, okay. Okay, okay I revised my motion. Second. Thank you, David. All right. Um, David White. Yes. Brian McBride. Yes. Mike Gildeskane. Yes. David Kaplan. Yes. Susan Chapnick. Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. Okay, David White. Uh, so we'll you hear the um, you have that schedule. I think that we've given plenty of time. I would make sure that we have uh, heard from you. I understand issues can come up. Uh, please keep David Morgan informed as uh, I guess these little bumps in the road come up. Um, and that's all the advice I have. And with that, have a good night, and we're going to move on to our next agenda item. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Yep, bye now. So David White is going to give us an update on the Water Bodies Working Group. Okay, a few items. The reservoir is looking very good in terms of water justice. Mechanical harvesting in June did a lot. Plus, we had regular hand harvesting going on almost every week this summer the Missick River group. So it looks looks very good. I also might mention the reason there's so many volunteers harvesting is because the Missick River has now reached a maintenance stage in water chestnut control. So that's a goal for the reservoir as well, getting it down to a level that's much easier to maintain. And that's for the reservoir. Um, Spy Pond, um, I believe David Morgan, David Kaplan are going to talk about, uh, plan some, develop a plan for the Phragmites control. We're going to, perhaps, um, recommendation for the commission. David, David, anything to say on that? Um, I think, I think we're still trying to um, figure out whether to, whether or not to consider the use of glyphosate. Um, the contractors have stated to us that the alternative that's been suggested to use isn't as effective and is often used in tandem with glyphosate anyway for it to be 
Um, so I think we need to have a further conversation on the Water Bodies Working Group if we're going to entertain um, a cut and wipe um, targeted glyphosate application um, for the for the Phragmites. Okay, further discussion. Okay. I also might note that Wayne Chenard has left Arlington for Belmont. Anything more about that, David Morgan? <laughs> Yes, uh, Wayne, on his last day, almost a month ago at this point, while I was out sick. So I missed sort of the tail end, but he's off to be there at Engineer over in Belmont. The DPW is working on hiring for his position and also hiring a uh, water and sewer engineer. And I have been assured by Head of DPW that that position will assume some of the responsibilities of evaluating stormwater. So it'll be spread out across the engineering division. Um, unless they get somebody equally savvy with stormwater to head up the, the staff over there. But um, just so everybody's aware of the staffing changes and how it affects our permanent processes. Okay. Wendy's is good rain gardens also. So that's a that's the thing we're going to keep moving along. That's all I have. All right. Thank you, David. Okay. Um, Susan, you put your hand down. So let's just move on to the tree committee. So uh, Sarah will give us an update on that. Sarah Alfarico, Alfaro Franco. Yep. Our the uh, last meeting was held on July 10th. And um there was an update on the tree canopy uh, program. They have, um, there's out of 70 trees, only one was left. All the money collected is with the town. Uh, they just know that bigger trees are harder to place than smaller ones. Um, they um, they also discussed the back of the sidewalk subcommittee, uh, I'm sorry, sub, uh, back of sidewalk uh, program that allows planting in public, uh, public streets. Um, and uh, and um, they basically have 31 separate addresses that are interested in, uh, in, the, in, in participating and the tree committee will reach out to the property owner. Um, I think that's, uh, that's about it. I wanted to mention that the next meeting will be August 14th and I will be out of town. So I was hoping that someone from the Conservation Commission would be able to attend. David White has his hand up. Oh. Are some of these plants on private property? Uh, so what's happening is the back of the sidewalk uh, program, uh, what it is is they are, they are allowing they're allowing um, planting that the the, um, the committee will pay for trees to be planted in private property 20 feet from a public way. Mm -hmm. And this is the goal again is to increase the tree canopy and uh, what the what the plan is for the for the property owner, to own that tree and be responsible for the tree after one year. And uh, what is not included are private ways. But uh, their goal was, it's a pilot program, their goal was to have 20 trees per year. And uh, what they report is, is already 31 separate addresses uh, that had interest to in participating. Okay, good. Were those all private homes as in single family residences? Do you have any more details about which addresses? I don't have the, uh, I do not have the list of separate addresses, but um, it can be single family, multifamily, as long as the property owners are agree, uh, agree to participate. So it can be the, um, the zoning, and the size is not as important. And you find that list on the website, right? On their webpage, you can sign up for this tree program? Yes. 
Okay. All right. So Sarah uh, asked if someone on the commission is available for the August 14th Terry committee meeting. So Sarah, is that in person or is it a Zoom meeting? It can be, it's hybrid. Hybrid. Okay. Do we have anybody available on August 14th? I, I can do it, Chuck. Brian McBride will, uh, will, will take your spot, Sarah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Brian. All right, moving on. Um, CPA committee, that's Brian McBride. Yeah, there's, there's nothing new from the committee itself. Uh, we won't meet again until October or November or something. Although, you know, David knows some of the projects are starting in, in action. I saw the Spy Pond Lane and some others are taking action. I don't know if that's really the report out you want, but from the committee per se, there's nothing nothing new. Okay, Brian. Uh, and Park and Rec is next, but Susan's informed me, but there is no update. The next meeting, I believe, is... Uh, what's the date? Maybe Susan can let us know the date of the next meeting. Yeah, the, the next thing. meeting is August 13th. 13th. And I plan on attending that one. August 13th is the next meeting. Okay, great. Um, that concludes our discussion items, and we're going to move on to the hearings. And the first hearing... Um, just a minute, Chuck. Sure. We have to vote on the town booth funds to be allocated so we can have a booth. I think we do. That's not on the agenda. Well, that, I, I have it on the Google agenda. Maybe it didn't end up on the Novus agenda. Yeah, it's not on the, that agenda. David, is. do we have to do it this meeting or is that? Uh, we do it in another meeting. I don't care. I think the court needs to do it anyway. Okay, yeah, I have the posted agenda and I don't see that okay. on here. Um, I just don't want to vote on something that's not on the agenda. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and if that works, and I've heard that it works from David, so we should be okay to move on. All right. All right. So uh, we're going to enter on to our first hearing, and this is hearing is for Thurndike Place. And um, so our consultant, CZA, CZA, uh, only today let us know that they're um, – completed their review. And so no one knew this and the applicant didn't know it and neither did the Conservation Commission. So before that came in, uh, we received an email saying that this applicant would like to be, uh, would like to continue this hearing. And I have to say not only that, no one had time to review uh, the information. And so that would be the 15th. So. I'm asking for a motion to continue DEP file number 91-0356, Notice of Intent for Thorndike Place, to our next meeting on 8-15. So moved. I have a second. Second. Uh, David, oh, David White's recused himself. David Kaplan. Yes. Brian McBride. Yes. Mike Gildas game. Yes. Susan Chapnick. Yes. And Chuck Peroni says yes. Did I get everyone? Yep. Okay. Can I just say one thing very quickly? I just want to inform commissioners that I did a review of who was president at what meetings and who missed what meetings. And the only vote eligible members of the commission are myself, Chuck Taroni, Nathaniel Stevens, and Dave Kaplan. David White recused himself, Brian McBride and Mike Gildas game missed more than two meetings. So I just want to tell everybody that so that in the future, as we go ahead, whenever we're having a hearing on Thorndike, everybody can talk about it, but only four of us can vote. And that's a quorum. Sorry. Go ahead. Sure. So we want to limit <laughs> discussion after we've continued, but I, I just want to add one more thing. I apologize, but uh, that information was also provided to the applicant. Okay, moving on. So we have um, second on our agenda is a request for determination of 24 Sheridan Park, which was continued from our last meeting, which was on 7 11 2024, and the commission will review this project under the Wetlands Protection Act and the bylaw, and it's for a deck. 
uh, a deck addition to the existing structure at Sheridan Park. Areas to be altered include buffer zone and um, adjacent upland resource area to Spy Pond. Uh, Vice Chair Susan Chapnick will be leading this, and uh, we did take a site visit, and our site visit was on July 14th. And I'm sure this is the information you have, but if you don't, I have the people that were on the site visit, and maybe you could ask for a site visit um, update. Susan, over to you. Great. Thank you, Chuck. Um, so Chuck explained the project. Um, we did a site visit on July 14th, 2024. It was myself, Chuck Taroni. Um, Mike, you were there? Was there? No, it was David Kaplan, David and, Kaplan Brian and Brian McBride. Thank you. And I did want to show a few pictures of that. If, if either Chuck or David Morgan could put those pictures up. Um, the reason we did a site visit is because the sketch was unclear. Um, we didn't really get a good sense of where the um, the deck was and what they were actually doing with it. You can see here pretty clearly, um, that's the deck they're taking down. Um, and then under it are pavers, which have some moss and things growing in them. They're actually reducing the size of the deck. So it's going to be taken up, I think about a third. Um, than, than what it appears right now. And it is raised on posts, whether or not those posts would be replaced, that was a little unclear, but if they were, they would be in the same place. So it was really kind of a, 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 a not a not a big issue, not an issue um, in, in terms of what's there and what they're doing. They're actually reducing the size of the structure. Um, the only other thing we noticed when we were there, this is just showing you from the, from it, it's a beautiful property. It has these gorgeous old trees, mature trees, and um, down and a, a fence, a <clears throat> small fence, um, where the shoreline is it, to keep try to keep out geese, which it doesn't do, but um, lets in small animals. But there was a rodenticide box, um, so if we do consider. Um, a negative to term, negative positive determination that um, we would make, I would want a condition for them to remove the rodenticides, which are not allowed in our resource area. Um, they probably just didn't know that. Otherwise, I, I wouldn't recommend any conditions. I think it's an, you know, it's, it's a reduction of the structure in the resource area. Any commissioners have comments or questions? about that. If, if not, I'll open it up to the public. Are there any members of the public who would like to make a comment on the request for determination of applicability of 24 Sheraton Park? Um, you can use your raise function hand, can, uh, raise function on the bottom of your screen and we'll recognize you. And David Morgan helped me, but I don't see anybody. No? Okay, I'm gonna close the public comment period. I'm gonna go back to the commission. Um, if there is no comment, could I get a commissioner to make a motion? Uh, I'll make a motion to issue a negative determination of applicability um, with the condition of removing the rodenticide from the resources area. Thank you. Um, is there a second? I'll second. Thanks, David White. And any further discussion? Okay, I will then take a roll call vote. Chuck Taroni. Yes. Mike Gildeskane. Yes. Brian McBride. Yes. David White. Yes. Dave Kaplan. Yes. And Susan Chapnick says yes. So um, Dave, David Morgan, you can prepare that RDA with the one condition of removing the rodenticide box from the resource area. Thank you. And I'll turn it back to Chuck Taroni for the next um, hearing on the notice of intent for the Medford Boat Club. Great. Um, moving right along. So we have a notice of intent, 091-0363, uh, notice of intent for the Medford Boat Club, which was continued from 7-11-2024. Conservation Commission will hold a public hearing under the Wetlands Protection Act and the Arlington Bylaw for Wetlands Protection to consider a notice of intent 
for aquatic management program of the Medford Boat Club. The area to be altered includes land underwater and associated with the Mystic Lakes. So at a last meeting, we had some comments from the commission and David uh, Kaplan had some questions and he wanted some uh, information put in to a chart. And um, I believe that we received that information. So I wanna bring on the applicant and I'm looking for the name, but maybe you could just raise your hand and, uh, and introduce yourself for uh, the record and then bring the Conservation Commission up to date with this project and with the uh, list of questions that you received, um, I guess, either before that last meeting or in between meetings. So, David Morgan, do we have someone here representing this project tonight? I'm not seeing them. Um, not okay. Seeing the raised hands. Yeah, let's give it a few more minutes. Boat Club. Yeah, use the reactions button at the bottom of the screen to use the raise hand function uh, or just turn your camera on and, and uh, let us know you're out there. So I think it would be best to do right now is just to continue this to the end of the meeting. If someone wants to make that motion, in case they show up, we can at least hear it. Um, we'll pick it up if they haven't got back on to this um, meeting. We'll continue it to our next meeting. So I get a motion to continue uh, to the last item on the uh, agenda tonight. So moved. A second. Second. Okay. Um, Mike Gildas game. Yes. Susan Chapnick. Yes. David White. Yes. David Kaplan. Yes. Brian McBride. Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. Okay, we've continued that to the end of this meeting. Next on the agenda is a notice of intent from Ononomy Rocks Park. Uh, they did receive a file number. It's 091-0365. Um, the Conservation Commission will hold a public hearing under the Wetlands Protection Act to consider a notice of intent for replacements of a playground at Mononomy Rocks Park in Arlington. The area to be altered would be buffer zone and adjacent upland resource area associated with an isolated vegetated wetland. Okay, so Natasha is here and Susan has her hand up. Hold on a second for the applicant. Susan, would you like to say something? Yeah, I just want to make sure um, you said this at the beginning before we started recording that we are hearing this application under both the Wetlands Protection Act and our local bylaw and implementing regulations. Is that correct? Oh, yes. Uh, so, so it, Nata Natasha, right? Natasha, we're, can you let us know if you were intending to have the commission hear this under both the uh, act and the bylaw because it didn't say that on your application or in the on the agenda so that good afternoon uh good evening everyone can you hear me okay yes okay um thank you so much as you may or may not know i'm natasha Whedon. i am the interim director for the recreation department um i'm really sorry i know i'm here representing this but i don't have all the answers so i'm gonna ask emily hunt um from copley and uh I forgot, Wolf, uh, to please just um, see if you can help me answer this question. And thank you everyone for bearing with me. Joe has small feet, but they're very big shoes to fill and I'm doing the best that I can. So thanks for your patience. Okay, Emily, do you have an answer to that? I could help you out if you want. Sure, I think I may need you to help me out. Um, yeah, I think our you do department... wanna be heard under both the act okay. and the bylaw and okay, and great. then that will take care of both at the same time. So great. thank you. duly noted, uh, Duly noted. Okay, so with that, could you could introduce yourself and your team uh, for the public record, and then present your project, um, and then we'll take questions after that. Great. Thank you, Chuck. I'm Emily Hunt. I'm a landscape architect with Copley Wolf, and we're the designers for the Monotomy Rocks Park and Picnic um, play area. Um, Natasha Whedon is the um, project manager for the town, and Katie Cruz is the civil engineer um, assisting on the project. Um, would it be okay if I share my screen to show the plan? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. Thank you. 
Give me just a moment. Great. Um, are you able to see my screen? Could you make it a little larger? That's of course. Yeah. Is this a little bit better? That's that's great. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, so we are um, working on the play area and picnic space at Monotomy Rocks Park. It is a smaller section of the park. Um, and there was an existing play space in this area um, that in 2019, there was a safety audit done um, in realizing that the current equipment just wasn't up to standards. Um, and that's when we were hired to help do a redesign for it. Um, when we had our survey conducted in the fall of 2023, um, they did identify a wetland. And we realized that the existing swing structure was partially located within the 25 foot buffer. So the plan that we've proposed um, moves a lot of the newly proposed play equipment um, outside of the 25 foot. That was some feedback that we had heard when we originally came to the commission um, and keeping all of the play structures um, out in between the 50 and 100 foot buffer. Um, in the 25 and 50 foot buffer, we would just be doing some planting because we are um, having existing uh, swings demolished. So we would need to um, mitigate that area. Um, a larger part of the project is just redoing a stone dust pathway. Um, so it currently exists as more of a gravel pathway and we're making it a stabilized stone dust pathway, really just matching existing condition to make sure it's accessible to the space. Um, and there will be a pavilion on a concrete pad, but that's located outside um, the resource area entirely. And the play space itself, um, we heard from many of our public meetings that the public really wanted the play space located within the trees. So we did um, several site visits to make sure that we could locate each play space, each play piece and be very sensitive to the existing tree roots um, because we don't wanna disturb the trees. The only um, action to the trees that we'd be doing other than having temporary construction fence would be some minor pruning to make sure that we meet all the safety compliance um, around the play structures themselves. And then for safety surfacing, we wanted a more natural approach. Um, we had heard that from the CONCOM too. So we're using an engineered wood fiber, which is just an all natural so um, softwood pieces. There's no plastic or rubber um, or chemicals in it. Um, and the only piece on top will be a temporary rubber mat. And that's just to make sure we're meeting the Massachusetts Architectural Access Board. Um, accessibility. So they do need these mats that will be placed in certain portions of the engineered wood fiber to reach each type of play piece um, in the project. Um, so that's the project, um, a, an overview of it. Um, if there are any questions or comments, I would love to hear them. Sure. Can you uh, just stop sharing screen so we can just see the uh, screen a little bit better with other people? Yeah, so uh, commission members, please uh, um, raise your hand if you have any questions for um, Emily. So, Emily, I have a, I have a question. Um, there's, it looks like there's within the, I'm going to call it the 25 foot no disturb. It looks like there's a triple line drawn. Is that erosion control on the on the plan, or is or is that some sort of barrier? Correct. That's erosion control. So it would be temporary. Um, it would be field located with our contractor, and it's really shown more diagrammatically at this point, just so the contractor owns the scope. Sure. And what are you what are you uh, specking for the erosion control? I'm happy to um, start that. And Katie, feel free to chime in because I think Katie is taking a little more of a role with this. But we would be using a temporary chain link fence, um, and then we would be using um, straw wattles and a silt fence. And Katie, feel free to add anything else. And I may have missed. That's good. That's it. Yeah. So that chain link fence is that. Um, stands, uh, it's not um, pounded into the ground. Is it just on uh, little blocks that hold it up? 
yeah, we would recommend that here. So nothing's driven in to protect the tree roots. Yeah, that seems to be a lot, the chain link fence. Um, is that, what's the reason? We usually just ask for like hay bales and silt sock or just straw wattle or, you know, mulch sock, you know, softer material uh, in that area. Is the chain link, do you expect construction equipment in that area? Or is, it, or is there some digging going on and you're trying to meet a different requirement like uh, Jackie's Law or something? Um, so the main reason is because as the play pieces go in, it can become an attractive nuisance for kids to play on, especially before the safety surface is installed. So we recommend the chain link fence to keep kids out while it's a construction site. Mm -hmm. And I guess my last question is, there's you've looked at this and there's no way it could be moved out in certain areas beyond the 25 foot. So we did look at many different options. Um, those were our public meetings. And one option looked at moving it more into the lawn space. Um, one looked at moving it into the hillside that didn't have as many trees um, completely out of the wetland buffers. But the hillside is used as a sledding area in winter and is very beloved by the town. Um, and the lawn is used for many different public events, or not events, but just public activities. Um, and so our feedback was really to keep it in the approximate location that it's cited on the plans. OK. All right. So with that, I'm going to go to Brian McBride. Oh, unless Mike is first, I don't know. I'm just want to cut line. Oh, sorry, I didn't see you, Mike. I don't know who's first. You can fight it out. Go ahead, Brian. <laughs> okay. I guess I just wonder. I'm I, sorry. I may have missed some of these meetings when I was traveling. But um, are we are we building in some jurisdictional areas that we don't have to? And why wouldn't we've got the whole meadow there with the where the dogs run free? Um, why would we build in a protected area or semi-protected area when we could simply move it into that meadow area and be completely out of any kind of buffer zone? Um, that's what I understand. So we did propose that. Um, we did several studies on that too because we had the same idea to really protect the wetland. Um, but because a lot of the neighbors and town is used to using the play area where it's located, there was a lot of feedback that that's what makes it so special um, is having it in the trees. And so we were able to find play pieces that we can tuck in without doing damage to tree roots and locate it there. Um, and so we really were able to use that 50 to 100 foot buffer um, and site the play pieces within that um, and not go into you know the 25 foot zone. Um, but in terms of the lawn space, we just had a lot of public feedback that that's not what was wanted. So it, it is possible to give greater protection to the wetland, but there was some public uh, resistance to that decision. So right. I guess that puts the Conservation Commission in an interesting position about you know, the balance between public desire and protecting wetland. Okay, Brian, are you, uh, are you set? Do you have another question? Oh yeah, sorry, I said thanks, yeah, I'm all set. Okay, uh, so we're gonna go with Mike Gildas game right now. Hi, thank you, yes. Uh, in looking over the uh, plans, I'm just wondering, uh, is the are the new play structures going to be uh, primarily uh, plastic, uh, or are they going to be wood and metal? Yes, um, that was a desire was especially from the public was keeping everything as natural as possible. So we are using all wood play structures. Um, a few of them do have some rope elements on them. Um, so more of like a flexible climber and then there will be some metal pieces as well. But for the most part, they're all wood. And what do you uh, expect the construction time from start to finish would be? So the project is um, just going out to bid this month and we ex anticipate it will be awarded to a contractor um, probably around October. Um, the contractor will have late fall to do some initial demolition, but we see the bulk of the site improvements going in in spring once the weather is favorable and um, so, uh, final completion needs to be done by July 1st of 2025. We've got a year to go. Um, and um, 
that I think those were my that was my main issue. Thanks. Uh, David Kaplan. Yeah, thank you. Um, so looking at the plan, I don't know if you want to pop it back on the screen. Maybe it might be easier to to talk about. Um, there is a a blob section in the southwest corner that's the mitigation seed mix that's being proposed. I'm curious as to what is happening just to the north and east on the way to that level spreader um, discharge point. What what's going on in that area? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, the area north is where. Um, if anyone's familiar with the site, that's Woodhenge, which is those um, movable stump seating pieces and sign. Um, the town will be relocating them within Monotomy Rocks, but not by the play because they've been picked up and moved into safety zones and become a safety concern. Um, so we do not want movable pieces anymore. So in that area currently is a lawn. So we would propose that it would be seeded with a native grass mix. Um, and same anywhere in this zone, east, north, and east up to the level spreader, we would just reseed with a native lawn mix since it's currently lawn. So just matching the existing condition. Okay. Well, I, I would encourage you to naturalize that space as much as possible. I think that could be a good compromise between, you know, meeting the town's interest to keep the um, the character of that of the play space within the tree line. Um, but also, you know, taking out lawn in a resource area and naturalizing that. And I would even, even encourage you to look into um, planting trees to extend um, that, that tree line to the um, west from you know, the treed area of the, of the play space, um, in addition to some sort of meadow mix um, and really um, look to, that, that seems like a lot of opportunity there to um, restore um, some natural habitat in a, in a jurisdictional resource area. That's a great idea. We'll, um, we'll look into that. Thank you. If I could I just- see if I could just Sure, seeing Brian McBride. Sorry, Chuck. I just wanted to say uh, that does sort of fit with my concern too, as well as balancing the um, the play, the recreation, and the park. The park and rec is responsible for seeing a greater focus on the on the habitat would be really uh, great to see. Okay, uh, I have a couple more questions. Uh, I don't see any of the commissioners, and we'll turn this over to the public. So the wood chips is is that what you're using amongst all the equipment? Yes, correct. And what's your, what is your plan to keep it from migrating into the mitigation area? So we're proposing around all of the engineered wood fiber that there would be a timber edge. So a wood edge that's um, raised a little bit higher to keep contain the wood chips since they are um, a movable piece of surfacing. How high are we talking about? Just about six inches. Six inches above the top elevation of the wood chips? Um, it would be six inches from, at the most, from the um, naturalized side, and then maybe only one to two inches to start with the wood chip side. Um, but the wood chips do get compacted over time, so that's why we would keep it higher to start, and then it would compact down. Did you provide the commission a uh, operation and maintenance plan for this area on what you expect to do for maintenance, such as what I just mentioned, the, um, bringing the wood chips back into that play area? Um, we did not provide that as part of the submission. Typically, that's done by the contractor, but we're happy to help provide that if the commission needs it as part of this NOI. Sure. I had a question about. Um, the swing sets and the swing sets. Oh, um, I'm sorry, I, I, I did see an O and M plan and the part of the stormwater report um, with Hancock from Hancock Associates. Um, it may not be as um, 
but there there is some information in there about the stormwater structure. I'm not sh necessarily sure it includes the five bar, but right, so just, to, just to yeah, um, just to that... point that out. Sorry, Katie, go ahead, please. No, um, you're correct that that operation and maintenance plan within the stormwater report focuses on stormwater. Um, I think it includes some vegetated areas maintenance. Um, but it doesn't address the, the wood fiber surfacing directly. All right. Thank yeah, you. So, Sorry to interrupt, just to clarify. Thank you. Yeah, I would be looking for not only the wood fiber, but any, you know, to, any maintenance that needed to be done to just make sure that this is in good shape, which I'm sure has to happen. But whatever that demarcation line that holds the wood fiber chips in, is um you know regularly being raked back or picked up or, or or something like that or anything else if there was sand if there was other material that was proposed to being used um so an operation maintenance plan for the actual maintenance of the park that's not storm water i guess is what my request is so I was going to ask about the swing set area. It seems like it's wedged into the 25 foot zone um, in that south corner. And is that, so that's being proposed and it says wood chips around it. And it seems like the area that's been marked out as the play area with, where you expect you know, your travel lanes to be would, um bring it quite close to wetland flag is that 811 oh b11 sorry wetland flag b11 and so what was why does that have to go so close is there any way to move that further north oh may i share my screen again sure yeah um sorry just a moment So I'm just zooming in. Chuck, you're referring to this swing set area? Yes, is that being removed? Yeah, so that's the current swing set um, that we thought was too close to the well. Like it's in the 25 foot um, on either side. So this will be removed. <laughs> All right. That was all my questions. Susan, did you have your hand up? I'm not sure if. Um, I didn't, but I, I just wanted to, to echo some of the other comments that, um, in, in early discussions, I, I, I was trying to advocate for moving the, everything further away from the resource area, but we do understand we need to balance recreation as well as protecting wetlands, though our, our wetland hat is firmly on our heads in this commission. Um, so, so looking for some additional um, habitat enhancement, um, maybe as Dave Kaplan and Brian McBride were discussing, um, would help me feel more comfortable that we're not um, we're we're not harming um, the resource areas more than we are right now. So. Just wanted to support that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So this. So I this think Dave Kaplan has his hand up again, Chuck. I don't know if you saw that. Sure, Dave. Why don't you uh, take? Yeah. It? Thank you. Sorry, I just remembered I had another question, and maybe this is for Katie about the stormwater design and the under drains. Um. I guess this is along the lines of really trying to maximize the opportunity for recharge in that area. It looks like a lot of the under drains are sort of set um, at the bottom elevation of the engineered surface where that meets the, um, you know, the, the ground, I guess the, you know, the natural ground, I guess. Uh, is there any opportunity to, you know, elevate those under drains in a way that provides more freeboard and opportunity for infiltration, you know, under the under drains so that everything's not sort of pooling you know, meet where, where it meets, I guess, the whatever you have for your engineered backfill and the natural ground. 
where it could, um, you know, ha have some more opportunity to sort of sit and perk rather than going right out that under drain and into the level spreader. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the under drain system is set within a reservoir layer of crushed stone um, that can hold a volume of stormwater. Um, the system is really to just kind of keep it from getting swampy, it, you know, if the water needs to get out. Um, but I think that the, given the surface area of the stone and, and the depth of stone, there's a lot of opportunity to to hold water and promote infiltration. And I know we have that outlet and level spreader and that's more of an emergency overflow. I don't really expect much water to actually leave, number one, because there isn't a big um, this watershed, not a big contributing area. Um, and two, right. it's mostly pervious. Um, all right, so, so, you, so you don't expect the grading of that area if there were a rain event that all of that rainwater would be sort of fundal, funneled to one of these under drains and then find its way out. It would just sort of sit, you know, along the whole, you know, like around the whole surface area of the play space. And then what can perk will and what needs to, um, what can't will find its way through the under drain. Okay. I was just... Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. it's such a small site. This the total limit of work is about 0.4 acres. Um, I expect, you know, I did a quick calculation. The peak runoff from the hundred year storm would be less than a CFS. So there's just okay. not a lot of stormwater volume here. Okay, all right, thank you. Okay. I have one more question then. Since we're talking stormwater, when you did a quick calculation, did you do the, did you use the NOAA Atlas 14 plus rainfall data? I did. Yeah. Um so our our regulations require the plus plus, the like high end. Like you said, it's a small site, but it does get swampy there. Yeah. I missed it. <laughs> well, I think, you know, look. Overall, I know that Arlington considers stone dust to be impervious, so we modeled that as impervious. Um, the increase in impervious area, even with the pavilion, because we're removing some of the stone dust pathway that there's there's now, it's about 150 square feet. Um, and with the mitigation measures, with our crushed stone infiltration trench around the pavilion and with the stone underneath the fiber surfacing, there's really no runoff from the site um, until okay. you get until the 50 year storm, which is I think like a seven inch storm. So that, that would be a huge um, storm event. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I wanna to turn to uh, anyone that uh, is attending tonight's meeting that would like to make some comments about this project, if you could, use the reaction button and the raise hand function and uh, introduce yourself for the record first and then state your question. Uh, right now I'm not seeing any hands for this project. Okay, at this point I'm gonna close the public comment portion of this project and move back to the Conservation Commission. Uh, just to let you know, it does sound like we have some questions. Um, naturalize uh, the mitigation planting area and operation and maintenance plan for the maintenance evolved around the swing, swing set area, but the whole playground outside of that, um, outside of that barrier, uh, the demarcation uh, barrier. Any other requests from the commission on this project? David Kaplan, were you satisfied with the um, stormwater questions? I what came to mind when you were talking about that is I was wondering if that was perforated pipe or if it was solid and it was just whatever was in it was going to be delivered to the level spreader. And if there was an opportunity at that end, even though we're talking about very occasionally to do some sort of rain garden in that area. But it seems like you had more of a handle on this than I did. So I wanted to ask you that question. 
No, I think I think that's a good question just to pass along to, to Katie. If she can address that. Yep, so the underdrain system does consist of perforated pipes. That's how water that collects in the stone would get into the pipe system. Um, at the level spreader, I think we actually did propose a small area of kind of typical rain garden plantings with a little depression there to also promote infiltration and, and treatment. Um, this is a, a very, there wouldn't be any um, contaminants in this water, but um, we, in, acknowledging that, you know, having a little rain garden is favorable, we've actually added that in just upstream of the level spreader itself, so. So we would, so you, you thought about that. Is it on the plan somewhere? I'm not, you said it's upstream from the level spreader. Or are you going to take our our uh, question and try to install it? I'm, no, Emily, could you share the plan again? So this is, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, you can describe it, Emily. Um, so this is the pipe to the level spreader area um, and this hatched area within the depression that Kitty mentioned, we did call out as the rain garden seed mix. Yeah. Um, can I yeah, so, uh, oh, just one second, Susan, Sorry. unless you're asking about this, because I, I just wanted to, I don't see any uh, elevations in there. So is it, so I don't understand how it's designed. It, could you provide a detail on that? Yes, let me flip to the civil page yeah. that you submitted. So this is the level spreader detail. Um, mm -hmm. So you can see the basin here. Yep, so it's it's six inches deep. It's not, you know, it's not a significant detention basin. Um, you can see the, the outlet pipe on the left side. We showed a little bit of crushed stone at the outlet pipe to prevent erosion. Um, but really what the shallow basin does, and again, I don't really expect this to receive much water, um, kind of just slows things down a little bit more, gives an, an opportunity for infiltration. And then the level spreader just provides a really gentle outlet um, if, if anything does overtop. Um, that would prevent any uh, erosion downstream. Are you going to be able to reuse the uh, topsoil in this area, or do you have uh, a spec on the topsoil, and do you have a spec on the uh, riprap? Yes, we do have specs on the topsoil. Um, we require that the contractor tests all of the topsoil to verify suitability, and if it's below any of our um, spec ranges, um, those are all based on different planting standards, um, then the contractor is responsible for amending them um, to make sure that they're suitable for the mixes that are going in. Anything on the, uh, on the riprap? Um, we do have an earthwork spec, so that should have um, different types of stone. We can double check um, that it has the riprap in there. I was just hoping it wasn't three quarter minus. Do you think it's larger than that? It would be larger than that. Um, I agree that three quarter minus wouldn't be sufficient for energy dissipation. So um, I don't think it would be the, the eight, eight to 12 inch angular stone that we see. It'd probably be closer to a, a larger crushed stone. Um, again, because there wouldn't be high velocities of the storm water coming out of the outlet pipe. I was just thinking of maintenance, um, the larger stone, you know, like a significant stone, like a five inch, something like that would create some crevices and that wouldn't need too much maintenance for a while. Anyways, um, could you just, seems like we're going to have a few questions to come back to this uh, again. And if you could just provide the spec on that, that would be great. And Susan Chapnick has her hand up. Thanks, Chuck. Um, I just wanted to go back to the naturalizing the area um, because I just want to make clear what 
the Conservation Commission looks for when we naturalize an area, just so there's no confusion when you come back. So we're looking for layers. We're looking for, you know, a ground cover layer, a shrub layer, and a tree layer. And we're looking for um, natural straight species, similar to ones that, that are there already, so that we know that they would survive, if that's possible. Um, so I don't know if you have that capability in your company or you need to get a landscape architect to do that. But anyway, I just want to make it clear what, what we were looking for. So. So we're not asking for a restoration and just right. naturalized. So we're just a step above rest a restoration. Right. We're looking at different layers mm. of habitat using the similar native plants that you find there ready so that we have a sense of survival. We usually look for um, a requirement of three-year survival. Um, we have certain standard requirements, um, which, um, you know, the town knows. Thank you. Okay, are there any other questions from the commission or you know, maybe we should go over what we're asking for before we get a motion to continue. And with that, I would ask the applicant if they agree that uh, and accept that we commission would like to continue to our next meeting on the 15th. And is that enough time to prepare this information? Yes, so the 15th of, oh, sorry. Sure, I was going to just go over information, but a uh, plan that shows a naturalized area, no one in plan for the uh, for the play area, and then specs on the riprap. And if I missed anything, commissioners, please chime in. So our next meeting is on the 15th, and if that works, I heard the, an agreement from the applicant. Could I get a motion from the commission? Uh, is it in the plan as well? Was that? Was it maintenance plan? We asked for that, yep. There's a stormwater maintenance plan already, and we're asking one for a maintenance plan for the rain garden and, you know, obviously the rain garden too, because that's uh, prepared. Susan, do you want to get into a maintenance plan for the naturalized area? Um, well, you should have some kind of information on how you're going to control invasive species invasive. and make sure that this area survives. Um, it doesn't have to be in a huge plan because it's going to be a small area, but you that you have to put a little bit of thought into that. Okay. Thank you. All right. So that's our list. And uh, can I get a motion to continue to the next meeting on 815? So so <laughs> I'm going to go with Mike because I saw his hand go up. The rest of you guys just talked. All right. Can I get a second? Second. David Kaplan seconds. Uh, Susan Chapnick. Yes. Uh, David White. Yes. Brian McBride. Yes. Mike Gildas game. Yes. David Kaplan. Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. Okay. Um, reach out to David Morgan with any questions. Uh, we do have a um, materials deadline for our next meeting so the commission can review it before that meeting i believe it's the wednesday before the meeting that you will be attending and uh if there are no other questions we're going to move on to our next uh, agenda item okay thank well, you thank you Thanks thank for you attending. very much yep. thank you Bye so now. much thank you okay. good night okay so we're going to move on to um what was our last uh, hearing for tonight, but we still have that one that we continued. So uh, this one is a DEP file number 0910364. Notice of intent for 103 Thorndike Street. The Conservation Commission will hold a public hearing under the Wetlands Protection Act. To so under the Wetlands Protection Act um, to consider a notice of intent for a construction of a multifamily residence on 103 Thorndike Street in Arlington. The areas uh, to be altered are include bordering land subject to flooding and associated that are associated with Alewife Brook. But before we go on, it's the same issue on this uh, on this application. The application and the agenda does not say that you want to be heard. 
uh, and have this discussion under the Wetlands Protection Act and the bylaw. So if um, is that Sean, uh, Sean, can you just introduce yourself for the record and just let us know if you would like to be heard under both, which is which is recommended. Yes. Um, good evening. My name is Sean Hardy, professional engineer with Hardy and Man Design Group, representing the owners. And yes, Mr. Commissioner, I would like to be heard by the act and the bylaw. Sure. Okay, Sean, now that you're uh, on and you've uh, introduced yourself for the record, you can introduce your team and bring the commission up to date with your project. Please feel free to share the screen. Okay. Um, Can you see that? Yes. Okay, so this is 103 Thorndike Street. Uh, there is an existing single family residence at the front of the lot here. There's an existing bituminous driveway um, and, and various walkways as well on the site. The proposal is, um, it's about a 4,300 square foot um, residential lot. The proposal is to demolish that existing single family house and put a proposed two-family house on that. Um, the front portion is going to roughly be in the same footprint of the existing residence. The rear portion will be um, on elevated on piers. It, it is, as we said, in the floodplain um, at, that's approximate elevation seven, which comes up well into the site. So in this existing area that currently there's a basement that will be filled in um, and flood vents would be put in as required by FEMA and the building code. And again, the living space is elevated up at about elevation eight, which is above that flood zone. And and this, as I said, rear area is to be elevated on piers with an area under for storage. Um, as far as the proposed grading goes, this is a net cut. We're proposing to, um, as you can see here, these proposed contours kind of hollow out some of the area to bring to lower the site down to what, what that elevation of that existing slab is um, on, under where the building is. The result is at about a 90 square foot or an 89 square foot reduction in impervious area because the walkways are being removed. Uh, the, the driveway is proposed to be as permeable pavers. Um, and as mitigation for kind of the increasing of the roof area, we're proposing the roof leaders to come down to a stone swale to go into this small bio retention area in the back that represents it's about 200 square feet um, but it provides the cubic feet required for you know recharge volume and water quality volume for the site it results in a net decrease for all storms 2 10 25 and 100 year um, we did revise the drainage calculations and resubmitted uh, a week or so ago because the comment came from staff that we hadn't gone to the correct NOAA atlas. So we, we did make that change with the big 11 and a half inch storm and we meet that requirement. Um, over, as I discussed, it's a cut site. So we did try and document that at each elevation between um, Right now, the site exists at about elevation one, but that bioretention area, we're hollowing it out down to an elevation of, of minus a half. So we are providing some storage down in that lower area. And each of these um, flood stage is increased, although the higher ones only slightly because they're up by where the house and the street are. But that area towards the back where the bioretention area is and where the grading is as you come up the house, the side of the house, we're increasing more that way. I think that generally summarizes it. If you have questions, I would be happy to try and answer them. Um, was there a planting plan, Sean, that you proposed? Could you go over any plantings that you're sorry? Going to put no, on we site? have we show the detail for the bioretention area. We were hoping that's something we could. Whereas there's going to be new people moving in here, and if we could work with staff, it's not very big. It's only a 200 square foot. Um, if there's some way we could work with staff to put some native plants, usually it's just some native grasses and a, and a shrub or two in there just to provide root mass to keep the mulch anchored down. Um, we were hoping that was something that we could work through. Okay. So you didn't call out any specific species, tree no, we, or shrub? Okay. No. Okay. So uh, I see. Uh, 
I see that Susan uh, with the screen up in this way. I see Susan has her hand up. I don't know if anyone else does, but Susan, please uh, ask your questions. Sure, thank you. Um, I have a few questions. Um, one is thank you for, for redoing the calculations. I assume then you use the NOAA 14 plus plus at the high end of the um, rainfall data. Is that correct? We did, yeah. That I think okay. the 100 year storm was at 11 and a half inches. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah, that sounds right. Substantial. Okay. It is substantial, but you yeah. know what? It's happening. So, no. okay. Um, the other thing, and maybe um, David Morgan was going to bring this up. But um, he let us know recently that FEMA has new um, preliminary or proposed uh, maps that are, we're supposed to use. And I see that that you um, got your FEMA numbers, you, you accessed them in March and the maps I think came out in June. So you may need to, I think you need to go back and just see if the floodplain, if it changed. I don't know if it did in this area. I know there's certain areas of Arlington that changed. Um, am I getting that correct, David Morgan? Please, please um, let me know. We have the option to okay. apply those new standards to new permits. We haven't chosen to do that to date. Because we haven't had any projects yet. Exactly. <laughs> we're in the floodplain that we needed to do that we needed to handle it. But yeah, considering this project is just being considered under this, I mean, there's really no wetland. I would like to look at that. I, I feel that's important, especially yeah. for two family. And, you know, we're putting a lot, you're putting a lot of effort, obviously, you know, to raise this on piers and put, you know, and, and, and things in the, in the basement to allow water flow. You want to make sure you get it right. I feel like that's appropriate too for uh, this project starting out and every project moving forward. Okay. The, the one thing I guess I would like to, to say to that, um, mm -hmm. if it is in fact higher than the remedy to that would simply be to make the foundation taller and, and elevate the building. It wouldn't impact the design in really any way. Right. Great. Great. So yep. then that would just be a, a plan change to show that your elevations are still above, you know, the, the FEMA. Yeah. Understood. And you don't feel like you're up against the building code height limitations in any way. You're, you're, you're good with that, uh, Sean. Um, well, if that did put us and now of course where the, screen is being shared. I can't see the building. So we're allowed two and a half stories and 35 feet. We're at two and a half stories. I suppose if that did put us to that, that again, wouldn't necessarily be an issue here. We'd, we'd seek a variance for that with the hardship that we're in the floodplain. Mm -hmm. Great. I think that's a, uh, I just wanted to make sure you weren't going to go to zoning or building department and then have to come back to the conservation commission. So it sounds like that's something that can be handled. Great. Any other questions from the conservation commission? So we were asked about um, planting and they want to work with staff on planting this area. What, so, uh, Sean, can you let us know if there are any trees on this property now that are coming down? And um, that would be a good place to start, I guess. But any vegetation that's coming down. Yeah. We show this one tree over here, I don't think, because other than that, there's walkways that go to the rear and it just kind of slopes to the back. Um, okay. Kind of open. The, I mean, generally around the sides of the house, we're thinking loom and seed. It's not a very big area. As far as specific plantings, we would, for the bioretention area, you typically have sort of perennial plants or a shrub or something in there. That's what we were more or less asking. Okay. I think that you'd have to provide a list of what you're proposing. And then if the new homeowners would like to change it, they could uh, either deal with David Morgan uh, administratively, or David might choose to have it come back to the Conservation Commission. But I would at least like to start out with a list. And if you could fit some sort of tree and some shrubs in there, that would be you know, that would be what I would like to see. 
Any other questions from the Conservation Commission? Um, Chuck, so it does look like there's a tree back there on the left. Is that a tree? Yes. You know, so, so you, uh, I don't know if there was tree protection in in your plans. I I might have missed it, but we have requirements for tree protection in our regulations. So we would expect the existing trees, since you're not planning on removing them, to have tree protection because it would be near, um, you know, where equipment might be coming in and out and things like that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That was my only other comment. I agree with you about the bioswale, that I would like to see at least a list. And um, David Morgan could help you with that, Sean. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's, I mean, you could have maybe reached out sooner, but it's it's mm -hmm. funny. Some towns give you a list and then you use that list to go to another town and they're like, no way, you can't use right. that here. So. Right. Yeah, you can work with David, but I understand. All right, so uh, I'm going to turn this over to... Uh, people participating tonight in this meeting that would like to uh, ask a question about this project. If you're, if you're part of this project tonight, um, please raise your hand, use the raise hand function and let us know. And I see first up, I see Nicholas, uh, Nicholas, and for everyone first introduce yourself and your, and your address for the record and then ask your question. Thanks. Yes, good evening. My name is Nick Agoras. I own 99101 Thorndike Street, where the director And I was just wondering if any of the grades uh, will impact our property in any way. So they're at 99 uh, dash 101. Dash 101. Are any of the grades uh, directing runoff in their direction? Wait, is that to the right of this property? I'm not. That's yeah, okay. I see. I could see a name there. Yeah. Uh, no, we're not. So. The, the way we're grading it, it's kind of it's going this way. It's it's to swale the water back towards our back left corner where that bioretention area is. It, it's it's not to direct it off the site to the either side. It's to shed it towards that back where that bioretention is. Back here. That's the only question I. Have. All right, thank you, Nicholas. So what you're saying on both sides, for the other abutter you are creating a swale between the house and the property line um, and just it will deliver any rainwater down basically the center of that very small area towards the back. Yes, it's grading it down towards the back. Then, yeah. The other side's the town uh, as an abutter as well, so. Okay. And then, uh, so Nicholas, I know you're finished, but your hand's still raised. So just gonna check just to make sure you didn't have another question. So I'm going to move on to JP. JP, just introduce yourself for the uh, record and then ask your question. Hi, yes, uh, this is Bill Pontier, 112 Thorndike Street. Um, I think first of all, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay. <laughs> I know the video has been, everything's been cutting out and we haven't really been able to see the plans, just FY, FYI. Um, but I'm going to speak in, in specifics high level first and then Obviously, I know you guys all want to be on the phone all night, so I'll, I'll try to keep it brief. But um, just a few comments. One of the newer people on the street, been here about 12, 13 years. Um, high level uh, things that I think we should consider about this. JP, you're uh, cutting out, and I haven't heard you other than past what we should consider. Hello? Yeah, yeah, okay. I hear you now. Different device. <laughs> um, yeah, we missed all of that. Start again. Okay, sorry. Don't know why it's cutting. So I said I, uh, one of the newer people on the street, probably we have a 112 Thorndike Street, a single family house built in uh, probably 1950, maybe early, late, early 1900s. Um, like I said, I want in... Uh, essence of time uh high level things first i think in the area what we have to consider um is history and upcoming possible other projects that could already affect the worst um we're in the worst flood zone level 
state-stated um, and mandatory insurance. So I know that for a fact because I've been paying $3,000 a year in flood insurance, um, and that adds up over time. So high level, we already have many, many drains on our street, 116 to 120 Thorndike all have um, flooding out to the street, which freezes in the, in the winter time. Uh, this has been going on for several years and has, hasn't necessarily been addressed by a the town. I guess I don't know details, but I did send the details to Dave, Dave Morgan. Um, so if he could include that in the minutes or notes, if possible, for some some of our neighbors who could not attend. Um, the other high level thing that we have to think about is Thorndike Place, which has obviously been in the talks for forever. That also will impact our flood area. Um, I thought that we were in an area where we couldn't dig any more earth, uh, therefore not increase our foundation sizes. I'm not sure if that's Sean's plan, not being able to see the details, but it does sound like there's going to be a lot of moving earth. Um, and if he wants to talk to that later, that's great. But we have three three sewer drains right now in front of our house and uh, basically 103 Thorndike. And the park is right across the street from our house. All the water flows into these sewer drains, but they are also very highly clogged uh, with debris and such from over the years. So in general, I have a, a very high concern of, you know, A, are we making the footprint larger? Uh, is the flood insurance that <clears throat> they would have to pay, is that going to be governed by um, uh, a new new plan because it's a new building or structure and not godfathered in? Um, so flood insurance and, is not our purview, so that's not a question okay. yeah, for <laughs> yeah. us. And then um, just, la just lastly, I, I think high level again, right across the street, as you guys all know, there's a pump that I guess not having the history going way back. But if that pump stops working, I understand we will have uh, definitely property damage flooding if that pump doesn't work. Sure. Was that all of your questions? I Yep. I'm going to ask Sean, um, could you just uh, go over how this building has been elevated and how you've worked with the flood, um, flood maps to ensure that you're either meeting or uh, creating more storage? Sure. Um, so the existing house sits, you can see it's, it's, under this, it, it's somewhat harder to see. It's it's slightly wider and we're slightly longer front to back. It's basically the same square footage, um, but that existing house has a basement in it, which current regulations do not allow. So that basement area gets brought up to the same grade. Um, and then the structure has to be ele elevated above the flood zone. So we're having our finished floor at elevation eight and we're required to have flow through panels on all on the sides and rear of it so that that equalizes any flood waters that might um um yeah for well, clarification what does elevation eight mean so you have to uh i don't want to have this turn into just kind of craziness here so please raise your hand and we'll address those questions but uh sean you can certainly answer that um this time someone put in the chat that they couldn't see the screen i can see the screen i can see the plan um so i'm not sure what's going on with that but let's move forward and just use the raise hand function if you have a question please okay um so elevation is it's it's the height relative to a, a datum and we're using that same datum that FEMA is using so we can coordinate our elevations on this on the plan with the FEMA flood map they, they say they on the FEMA map that at least the current one my partner is who's also online is trying to check the preliminary um but 
The current is 6.8, we were holding seven, and the finished floor has to be a foot above that. So we're at elevation eight. Um, and as far as for the other, you know, not being able to excavate or, or handle earth in this area, that's part of that whole, um, that's through the Wellness Protection Act, what, that if you fill in a flood zone, you have to compensate by cutting. Um, we're we're not filling at all. We're actually, this is a, a cut site at every elevation. So a lot of times, and I know as a commission, you've probably seen it many times, you have a as much fill we're putting in, as much cut we're doing, and then it net has to be that it's a net cut. But we're we're doing no filling and it's all cut mm -hmm. site. So we're creating an additional flood storage. Um, as far so we are meeting the FEMA regulations, we believe the building code regulations relative to that. Um, that was all used to come to this design. So the original house had a basement and yes. that's being removed. Yes. So that's being filled up with earth. Yes. And there's going to be a slab on top of that. So what was there? was taking away from storage and now there's being storage added and the other thing that i'm hearing is that as a landscape is now they're taking away um, bits and pieces of that landscape and every bucket load of dirt that comes out of there creates more storage so when he says cut he means he's removing earth and it's going away. So every cut creates more storage. So this is, from what it sounds like, and I'll hear from the commissioners, from, from what it sounds like is just a project that's, that's not adding to the problem. It's actually helping uh, the problem. It's creating more storage on their site. So this shouldn't be an issue for any of the neighbors from what I'm hearing, but, um, but before I hear from the commission, I just see Dee Dee's hand is up. Hi. That's, it's uh, so the reaction button. It says react is a heart on it, and my on my screen. So Dee Dee, please introduce yourself for the uh, for the record and state your question. Hi, it's Darcy Devney. Uh, I live on Van Dyke Street. Um, I wanted to sort of point out and ask a question um, to, in fact, one of them is that there were uh, quite a few trees uh, on the driveway side of this house and either before or after they sold it, um, they all came down. So there are a lot less trees than there used to be and it was already flooding. There's a street tree that's not on this diagram at all, but I don't see how it could possibly survive what they're going to be doing just because um, I think the height issue is really important because you're, if you're already hitting that maximum before we might have to change things, this is going to be a really, really tall house compared to the other ones in the neighborhood. Um, Magnolia Park does flood. Uh, in fact, um, people were kayaking on it at one point. <laughs> so um, right up to the where this fence is between this property and the park. Um, so I'm not sure how they're going to do anything about that. I believe the pump that was referred to is uh, a pump that's supposed to work for alewife. And it basically keeps alewife stationed from flooding. Uh, but that means that if there's a conflict between that and Thorndike field flooding, they they go ahead and let Magnolia Park and Thorndike field flood. So the other thing is that whole chart in the upper right about um, the minimum and maximums, as in yeah, that one, the dimensional, um, looks... I'm just kind of stunned that all of that can be done. I mean, it's everything is being, I mean, it basically is doing lot line to lot line as much as it can and up as well. So I guess that's legal or you guys have to say that. I don't know who decides whether that's okay or not. 
but I just wanted to point out that this is some of those percentages are just ridiculous. But that's all. So uh, tre trees and and maximum building things that I'm worried about. And Bill's was quite right that the um, flooding is, it's just going to keep being an issue in this neighborhood. It really is. And that house is already what, what we call the crooked house, because I don't know if you can see in the pictures, but basically the entire back left end of it, where this new swale is going to be, is already down, like the whole house tilts down toward that. So I'm not sure how this storage thing is going to help that. You know, you would think that if you just put in more dirt, you get the house up higher, but that's not what you're doing, right? It's on columns. Okay. And the columns mean that if it says it's 35 feet tall, it's 35 feet tall from the ground or 35 feet tall from? From the ground. It's If it's a sloped site, it's an average, but it's from the ground. Okay. And it is a sloped site, I believe. Okay. Right, counts as a sloped site. I read that right? Yeah, it slopes from the front to the rear. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. Thank you. I see David Morgan has his hand up, our conservation administrator. David. I'm looking at the a view of the house from 2020. It looks like there was a street tree that was removed sometime prior to that, and a tree on the neighboring property that actually got taken out. But I'm not seeing anywhere that there could have been growth since so, that date where trees would have been removed. Do you have any more details about where those I trees think were located? In the new one, it's that they're um, the driveway for the new one, they're moving the curb cut, is what it looked like in the pictures. So instead of the curb cut going to that long driveway on the left, the parking is actually going to be sort of straight in from the street. Is that correct? Yes. It's going to be on the right. So this, I think this is that same street viewer, David, that you're probably looking. I shared on my screen. I can see it. And, Thank you. And it doesn't show any street trees in front of the house. And it does show. So that other tree in the rear, it's it's kind of on the lot line. So mm -hmm. it's it's removed from. Um, yeah, some of the, town, the, the trees that were removed were town trees and some were their trees. So. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so JP, I want to let you know, I did see your message. I will get, get to you, uh, but I want to go to uh, Michael from... Uh, Michael, do you, uh, you have your hand raised? Would you like to state your name and address for the record? Some, I don't know. Someone has some background noise going. Can they mute themselves? Thanks. Okay, Michael, uh, 96 points, that Michael. Hi. 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 Um, so my name is Michelle, actually. Um, but oh, Jesus. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. So I, I really appreciate all the work that, um, that Sean has done uh, for the project and explained. I just have a couple of quick questions. Um, I saw that the, um, the square footage is going to be reduced from 1499 to 1410, which is great. I wanted to ask about it looks to me in the plan view that the front of the house, the front half of the house is going to have a basement and the rear back of the house, the rear side of the house is going to be on posts or, or columns. Am I right about that? Uh, no, the front can't, it can't have a basement. Okay. Um, it's more probably the front will be more considered like a crawl space area. It has to have flow through panels. It's, it's just going to be on a traditional foundation, but FEMA regulations don't allow it to have a basement. Okay, so that means that the um, that found it, the, that flat area that you're talking about um, will actually be higher than the than the basement was. It'll be closer to grade than the than the original basement of the house was. So you'll Correct. be you won't be as deep in there, which is which is great. Um, I wanted to ask about two things. One is the bioretention area, and if you wouldn't mind, just a very quick description of what that does. 
and whether it's something that's visible from the park, will folks standing in the park be able to see almost like a waiting pool at the back of the property? And if that overflows, will that just flow directly into the park? And then I have another follow-up question. Um, yeah, I, if, so down here is a detail of what generally they typically look. There's, it's a it's a kind of a hollowed out area, and that was part of the discussion. I, I'm hearing we're going to have to come up with a plant list that staff's going to um, want to approve with the commission. But generally, it's just a low. It's about a six to eight inch deep area. It, it's got it gets excavated out, gets filled with sand, and then the mulch, and then some plantings, and the stormwater gets there's a swale that directs water to it as well as the runoff from the yard can go to it. Mm -hmm. um, it's not, um, to use the word a pool, it's 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 not. We've done calculations that it, it, it by regulation, it has to be dewatered by a certain time after it stops raining. I think we were about, at about 18 hours. Um, it's very low. You wouldn't, yeah. the park, it's not intrusive to look at or anything like that. Okay. If it, it does it have a, I'm sure you've done the calculation to make it the size it needs to be for the, the, the size of the yard. My question is, if it overflows, will it flow into the park? If water overflows from the retention pool area, will it just flow into the park? It will, but it, that's just when I say that, it sounds worse than what it is. We're, we're tasked with reducing the runoff. So right now, there's nothing on this site that stops stormwater. So any, any rain that hits the roof of the driveways or anything, it goes back that direction now and its discharge point is at the park. Part of the regulations is we're tasked with keeping more water on our site than if we if we build this, we have to hold more water on our site than the existing condition is. Um, so we've shown those calculations that we're reducing what actually makes it off the site. Okay. And then one follow-up question is um, on page 62 of the documentation that you provided, it talks about a series of um, oversights for the site post-construction. And I'm wondering who provides oversight for that? There's a whole list of, of different, um, different tasks that will be done, actually. Uh, let me just see if I can. The homeowners. So that's, I think you're referring to the operation and maintenance plan. Yes. We're, yes. We're, we're required because this is a stormwater feature and it's being used to reduce runoff and, and meet some of the regulations, they are required to maintain it. So that goes along with the property. It gets recorded with the property. Um, it's not a high level of maintenance. They just have to more or less make sure the mulch is there and replenished and there's not full of trash and debris and that there's not invasive things growing in it. Yeah. And the last thing I want to say is that a neighbor who wasn't able to attend tonight um, provided me with a, um, a statement um, and she said that she would like someone from the neighborhood to share her testimony. I live at 135 Thorndike Street, which is a few houses away. She said um, she and her neighbors spent upwards of $30,000 in the last 10 years dealing with flooding caused by a rising water table caused by construction um, directly, the, the, the construction directly at their property and adjacent to their property. The town put an incredible amount of money and two years of effort to add a water line to our street that directly connects our property's sump pumps. There are three properties adjacent to each other, which all have sump pumps, and these houses are adjacent to uh, Bill Pomptier, who spoke a little while ago. Um, this is supposed to prevent flooding on the street. Um, there have been still multiple floods in garages in spite of this, um, and Bill mentioned earlier that there's, it's been somewhat, somewhat rectified but there was a lot of um some pump um you know splurging out into the street and then during the winter uh it freezes and and i personally fell in, in front of it you know my, my son laughed at me it was pretty funny to him but um i guess the point is that um even with thirty thousand dollars of expenditures plus the town doing everything they could these folks are still dealing with some pumps and you know the water problem has been mitigated to some degree, but we just want to make sure that what is going to happen here um, is not going to make anything worse. And Sean, from what you've said, that seems to be the case. But I would be, you know, I'm I'm providing this statement because a neighbor um, requested that somebody say something, so that's why I'm saying it. Okay, thank you. I'm going to go to Susan Stamps. And then after that, um, it's JP again. So, uh, Susan. 
Well, thank you. <clears throat> Susan Stamps, I'm here for the tree committee. Um, I just have a quick question about um, what is the length of the um, the front of the property along the sidewalk? Like, what's the front of the what's the front um, lot um, side length? The front of the lot looks like it says forty five feet. It's so, a forty five foot width. Okay, well, so because um, the um, special town meeting last fall passed a new zoning bylaw requiring in major development, meaning the kind of project that you have, whether it's new construction or it's increasing the size of an existing place uh, by 50, over 50% to plant a street tree every 25 feet is the is the conservation commission aware of that particular zoning bylaw that's new? Um, and it strikes me that it may apply to it probably applies to this project, but I didn't hear anything about their plan to plant new street trees. I can speak to that. <clears throat> I'm certainly aware of the bylaw. I know that the commission can't consider planting of street trees in terms of the scope of the project. I mean, it can't be counted as mitigation or any other such um, in terms of the permit. So it would need to be worked out with the building department um, when you go through your building permit. Then tree division will have a look at it, say, you know, this is sufficiently wide to warrant planting a street tree. Uh, I think the building inspector will probably catch it. Um, okay. uh, that's how that gets enforced or administered, I could say. Thank you. Okay, Susan, uh, moving on. I said, uh, JP, are you online? I know you're on a phone. Do you have another question? Yeah, the, uh, more statements actually, but, um, <clears throat> and uh, again, directed mostly towards Sean. <clears throat> Earlier, we had talked about how the current house structure is uh, kind of unstable, and I'm sure it, and if you want to comment to it, uh, Steve, great. But um, the house structure, whenever it was built, you know, over the years, I'm sure being in a wetlands, the, the ground underneath it has become unstable, causing that house to become what it is today, and thus why it's being torn down. So I don't understand how you know, uh, putting on digging pillars, which also move earth, and then putting in a concrete slab. Uh, it just seems like if you're already building on land that is sus suspect, either due to water penetration over the years, you know, the frost heaves and everything else, uh, I, I still see a concern there. And then this is more of a probably a town statement but i would say that we've you've already heard from most of the people on thorndike street we all play pay flood insurance and really nothing has been fixed on the street for 10 years and i don't see how the town could move forward with this in, in the conservation sense could move forward with such a project here given that you know we're not doing our jobs to, to, to make the current residents safe and property values stay where they should be. Nobody wants to live on a flooded street, but that's not a question for Steve. It's more addressing building on a foundation that is already suspect. Okay, thank you. Um... So there's a couple other people, but I didn't know if uh, I didn't know if Chi Man was part of Sean's yeah, he's, group. He, he is yeah, my so, business partner. Yeah, so I think I'd like to have him talk now and uh, see what he would add because uh, we've heard a little bit from the applicants. Then I'll go to Nicholas and Twiggy. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Um, just want to address that, especially the uh, last comments that we had. Uh, we actually did that due diligence. We had boring on site. 
Uh, we understand the ground issues, uh, the soil, the construction of the project is going to be, it's not a transition, tran transitional spread footings. It is going to be uh, helical piles. Uh, our borrowing show their soft soil underneath. So it is going to be driving piles. Um, not driving, but this helical pile is going to be drilled down until they hit certain resistance. And we put a pile cap on top and the concrete slab or the building columns, it's going to be building on top of the columns. So we totally understand the ground conditions out there. Um, and also, I just want to stress that um, it's a cut site. We are lowering the ground and providing additional more storage volume. And the basement, I should say the basement of the building right now uh, is going to be the way we, we calculate our um, existing and proposed uh, for storage volume is that we compare the same building mass, existing and proposed, but the, the proposed building is actually have foot vents on it. So when, if there is a foot event, the water can actually enter the proposed enclosure. So we did not even account those volume inside the uh, proposed enclosure. Mm -hmm. So the, our proposed fast storage volume is actually going to be much larger than what our table shows. And that's because you're proposing those curtains in the, uh, yes. in the foundation wall. So to allow whatever water that hits the side where the house isn't, along the two sides of the house, it can flow horizontally across. So exactly. there's no obstructions. Yeah, no obstruction. They can, they can you know, the, the water level is going to be exactly the same level outside on the outside. So if, you know, let's say the the front elevation is at seven, is allow the front water go all the way up to elevation seven within the enclosure, which the existing building doesn't. Okay. Um, I said I would take Nicholas, but I, I'm just going to go to Twiggy first because Nick, uh, you had a chance to talk. So Twiggy Tipton. Oops. Hi, can you hear me? Okay. I'm Twiggy Tipton. I live across the street at 130 Thorndike Street. Just had a couple questions about the plan. Um, so there's a stairway in the back and I guess a stairway in the front leading into the um, building, the proposed new building. Are there going to be walkways? And what material would the walkways be made out of? Uh, no, we don't show proposed walkways. So what would be the ground covered leading up to the stairways? Well, the one on the front is a walkway. Um, it, well, I so I say no walkways, and then I tell you there's a walkway. But in front, we do show over here next to the driveway is a short little path that gets to that stairway. This, in order to cut down on the impervious area, it might just be like flagstones or something like that. It's it's not a proposed formal walkway. Oh, so you flat something some crushed rock or something to as yeah, ground. Just kind of like like a flagstone type, just. A walking surface, but not, and in the pavers that we are showing, it's permeable, so it's not. It, it it's got the sand bedding in it and the gaps between the pave, between the bricks. So, um, uh, so in the calculations, is a driveway pavers that counts as impervious or or permeable surface. It's technically not impervious, but it does have a, a high curve number. We're treating it as almost impervious, and the numbers still work. So. Got it. Okay. Um, so that that adds to the reduction in or in so that helps with the um, in terms of the calculation that shows that the new building will reduce the impact on flooding. Correct. Um, well, what's the plan for the other um, non build build, you know, the coverings of grass for the parts of the yard that's going to have a building on top of it? Yes, lawn and lawn and okay. seat. Uh, what about the, um, so the deck area? What's gonna be underneath the deck? 
it's typically just kind of a crushed stone. Mm -hmm. And that is that counted as part of like adding to helping the reduction? How, yes. How's that? Yep. <laughs> Okay. Okay. And, and, and sorry, and, and back to the um, how high is the building going to start? Like, what's the first floor? Is it eight feet above the ground? Is that where the elevation will start for the first floor? No, the first floor is about four feet above the ground. Oh, okay. So it starts at four feet. Got it. So it's kind of like a crawl space underneath it. Yes. Okay, got it. I wasn't sure what that meant. All right, thank you. Okay, so... Um... We've had a lot of discussion here tonight. I'm going to allow Michelle and Nick uh, to speak, but they have to split their time within five minutes uh, because my sense is that we're going to continue this and there'll be an opportunity uh, at the next meeting to ask any of these questions. So Nick, you can ask your question now. And state your name again for the record, please. Nicholas. Uh, we don't hear you. Nicholas, are you, uh, are you there? Okay, Michelle, you can take over and uh, ask sure. you a question. Maybe he left his hand up. Yep, just a quick question. Um, is the curb cut for um, automobiles been widened at this location or is that the standard curb cut because I know it's it's moved so is it is it wider than the typical and is that a space is that space or that driveway space for two cars side by side yes it, it's we're proposing a 20 foot wide curb cut and we're closing the existing curb cut on the other side and it is proposed to hold two cars great okay thank you for answering that that's okay all. uh one more time Nick are you there for your question okay Hearing no answer, we're going to uh, close the public session of this meeting, and I'm going to turn to Susan uh, Chapnick. Thanks, Chuck. Um, after a bunch of questions and everything, I feel like I need a site visit. Um, I need to kind of put put my feet on the ground there and really see it. I I am I'm pleased that it looks like. Um, we're creating flood storage and we're not exacerbating a problem that exists on this street, which I've heard from a lot of the public um, because of raising this um, this building and putting a bioswale in, but I really need to see it. So um, that's, I would hope that we would continue um, to the next hearing and that we would have a site visit for commissioners who want to do that prior to the next hearing. Thank you. Great, okay. Um... So we have, uh, we've kind of gone through this a little bit and I'm trying to, uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> so Sean and uh, she, I just want to let you realize that the commission does have some uh, more information that they're asking from you. So tonight we're going to ask your permission to extend this to uh, our next meeting on 815. So I'll just go over those questions that I have and the commission please add anything else that I've missed. So we want you to use the June FEMA flood map uh, to see if it meets the new standards. We want you to add tree protection to the plan. We want you to um, tell us how you're going to verify after the grading and landscaping is in that there is in fact, a swale on both sides. So that could just be a statement or review from the engineer. Um, then we want you to verify that there are no trees that are going to be removed for this property. Um, and then the discharge area, I was kind of concerned with when it was brought up that that discharge is off the property. So I was going to ask, did you have the engineering department review that? Don't think that that's allowed in my, uh, uh, and I, I don't think that's allowed uh, in other towns. I just wanted to make sure. And was it possible to have it discharged back on to like the lower half of your own property and then it could run off in that direction? I guess both have their problems. I understand that. But I guess my question is, 
what does the engineering department say about that discharge point? Um, so I'd like to see a driveway paver detail. I'd like you to, I'm not sure there's one on the plan. I kind of looked quickly, I didn't see that, but I wanna make sure that it is in fact permeable pavers. And then we're gonna have a site visit, but we don't have to talk about that tonight. We'll have David Morgan send out a doodle poll. So those are the questions. And so do you uh, give us permission to uh, um, continue Chuck, this? I think there was one more we asked for the, the plants planting a plant list for the bioswale area and we requested some uh at maybe one tree a shrub or two and some ground cover okay and add the plant list to that tree and a couple shrubs and ground cover so a complete planting area um herbaceous up so um i'm seeing nods do i have your permission yes. sure yes. thank you Commission, can I have a motion to uh, continue to 815? So moved. moved. In a second. Second. Okay, that was David Kaplan and Mike Gildas game. Susan Chapnick. Yes. David White. Yes. Brian McBride. Yes. Mike Gildas game. Yes. David Kaplan. Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Appreciate it. If you have any questions, reach out to David Morgan. Uh, he's there till 12 o'clock tomorrow and then from Monday on next week. Can I just clarify that the applicant needs to get materials to the Conservation Commission the Wednesday prior to the hearing? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. And just want to add that um, we did submit the stormwater permit to the DPW. So they, it is being under review. So we'll, we'll, we'll reach out to them to get some answer. Oh, hopefully we'll have that review yeah. in the next meeting. Great. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, with that, and thank you for everyone who attended that meeting tonight. So we want to go back to um, the Medford Boat Blo Club. So I want a motion to reopen that hearing. So DEP file number 0910363, notice of intent for the Medford Boat Club. A continuation from 7 11 2014. Can I have a motion to reopen that hearing from any commissioner? I'll make a motion. I'll oh, sorry. Seconded. And seconded by Mike Gildas Game. Okay. I mean, uh, David, David White. Sorry. Whoa. Get it together here. Uh, so, Mike Gildas Game. Yes. David uh, David White. Yes. David Kaplan. Yes. Brian McBride. Yes. Susan Chapnick. Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. So the hearing is now open. Okay. Uh, can the applicant for um, the Medford Boat Club uh, identify themselves and state their name for the record? Chuck, I think you missed Dave Kaplan in the vote. Oh, I missed. Did I? I think I got it. No, yeah, I think maybe. Yeah. I don't know, but I wasn't sure. Yes, yes thank I, you. Um, I don't see anybody from Solar Chico. My name's Alex. Is anybody from the Medford Boat Club or? Yeah, please raise hand functions. You can also turn on your video. That's all fine. You can also turn on your video and just wave to the camera if there's that problem uh, with the reactions button. Okay, seeing none, uh, the only thing we can do here is just continue it to uh, the next meeting on 8.15. Got a motion so to, moved. thanks, and a second? A second. David White, David Kaplan and David White. Mike Gildas game. Yes. Susan Chapnick. Yes. Brian McBride. Yes. David White. Yes. David Kaplan. Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. Okay, well, that concludes our agenda for tonight. Um, here's can something I, from A request, Ashley Pitts. Can I make more requests? I you request, can. I request that David Morgan reach out to Solitude and make sure that they're at the next meeting. I have a bunch of questions personally from reviewing the project. I think Dave Kaplan might have some and we need them here <laughs> and to answer them. Thank you. 
So we're getting a question in the chat about uh, 24, 24, uh, 24 Sheridan Park. That was approved at this meeting. So that's the answer to that. So uh, Sheridan Park will re be receiving a determination of applicability from David Morgan within the next week or so, and your project can start at that point. The only condition was that you are not to use rodenticides on the property within the 100 foot buffer zone within the Conservation Commission's jurisdiction. So that concludes that. Um, Okay, so that's it. So that's it for tonight's meeting. It was a little bit shorter than we expected, but uh, at this point, I'll I'll entertain motions to uh, uh, adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. David, seconded. It's o'clock too. Yeah, it's good. We got a good night here. Okay, so just uh, everyone, okay, wave your hands. We're all good to go. Good night, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Good night, everyone. Thanks. Thank Bye you. Now. ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help.